recording and um, Christy, take it away whenever you get, you're ready. Great, thank you so much. My name is Christy Thomas. I'm here with Emily Week. Uh, we are both librarians at the Oakland Public Library. And we wanna say thank you all so much for being here. The Oakland Public Library has had the honor of hosting the Oakland Penn Awards at our Rockridge Library for several years. And even if we cannot do it in person this year, we are so glad to be able to continue this partnership. We really appreciate the work that Oakland Penn does to honor multicultural literature and their special focus on fighting censorship. Before we get started, I want to make sure that you know that 16 of our library locations are currently offering no contact sidewalk pickup service. So we are still uh, somewhat open for business. And so if you need books or DVDs or CDs from the library, you can place a hold on what you want and come pick them up when they're ready. We do have a wonderful selection of online resources as well. And you can get a library card virtually if you don't have one or if you've lost one. To get a card or to get help from a librarian, you can reach us by phone, by online chat and by email. And we're also offering virtual programming such as hosting events um, like our event this afternoon, as well as story time videos and our phone-based Lawyers in the Library program. Uh, we have a really exciting program um, next week on Tuesday called Eye of Newt, Toe of Frog, and it will be an engaging presentation about local amphibians presented by a naturalist from the East Bay Regional Parks District, just as an example of something that's coming up at the library. Finally, I encourage you to support today's um, esteemed authors by purchasing their books. And please consider purchasing them from the Bookmark Bookstore, which is the volunteer-run bookstore that supports the Oakland Public Libraries. You can visit them in their location on Washington at 7th in Old Oakland, or visit their webpage on bookshop.org. I am so honored to introduce Tennessee Reed, Chairperson of Penn Oakland and your host for this afternoon. Thank you so much, Tennessee Reed. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Tennessee Reed and as Chairperson of Penn Oakland, I want to thank you for joining us in the celebration of the 31st annual Penn Oakland Awards. The Board of Directors joins me in thanking the Oakland Public Library Rockridge branch, especially Allison Hack, Christy Thomas, and Emily Week for allowing us to present the awards virtually. To begin, I would like to read to you a bit of history about how Penn Oakland started, which was written by Ishmael Reed, a founder of this Penn chapter. It appears in his introduction to Fighting Words, 25 years of provocative poetry and prose from the blue collar pen, an anthology of poetry, fiction, and essays edited by Judith Cody, Kim McMillan, and Claire Ortalda that was published by Heyday Books in 2014. In the mid seventies, I was hired as director of the San Francisco State Poetry Center, uproar occurred. Some of the white poets feared a black uprising that would eliminate their participation. I met Floyd Salas. Floyd became my ally to reform what I was calling at the time, the AT&T of the poetry world, which at that time was dominated by the beat generation and its acolytes. I wrote an essay about this monopoly, which incurred the wrath of Allen Ginsberg, who bawled me out during a luncheon at Enrico's. I held my ground and Bob Callahan pointed out to Ginsburg about the B generation's reputation as misogynist and exclusional racially. Ginsburg saw the light and toward the end of his life taught a course in African-American literature at Brooklyn College. I was one of his guest lecturers. All one has to do is read poets and writers to see that the American literary scene is still a white chauvinist scene the possible exception is the Naropa Institute, which under the leadership of Ann Waldman is a model of diversity. The mainstream, forget it. With the exception of a few tokens, it remains one in which multicultural poets were marginalized. 
An example occurred recently in the New York Times book review, in which one of the tokens wrote about politics and contemporary culture. Not a single Black American, Native American, Hispanic, or Asian American was mentioned. Floyd had shown his mettle when a movement to make San Francisco State more diverse was met by a strong armed resistance. Al Young and I published his novel, Lay My Body on the Line, about the drive for an inclusive ethnic studies department. He is possibly the best Oakland novelist since Jack London. Floyd Salas was the perfect ally in our attempt to build institutions that would support diversity. In keeping with our philosophy of building our own institutions, instead of waiting around to be selected as a token by the establishment, like the dog who showed up every night at the train station to greet his master, not realizing that his master was dead, Floyd, Clara Otalda, and I founded Penn Oakland. We become known as the blue collar pen by the New York Times, which is appropriate since most of us are working class origin and often our discussion takes form of a Pier 6 brawl. Ultimately, we have survived these decades intact because none of us has forgotten where we come from. It's been 25 years since Claire Floyd, the late Reginald Lockett, and I met at Asmara, an Eritrean restaurant in Oakland, to establish another institution for the purpose of pulling the marginalized literature into the center. The resistance continues as a know-nothing Tea Party mentality sweeps not only politics, but culture. In Arizona, they are raiding schools and removing books by Chicano and Chicana authors from the shelves. In the same state, ethnic studies has been banned. The Tennessee Tea Party wants to ban any reference to slavery in textbooks. We are in for a long twilight struggle, but in the end, our country will be in better shape than the one we found. We have helped to create not an exclusive city on the hill, but the inclusive rainbow city in the valley. Next, I'm going to read a poem by Josephine Miles, the late Josephine Miles, who uh, is what we named our main awards after. She died in 1985. It's called After This Sea. This is as far as the land goes. After this, it is sea. This is where my father stopped, being no sailor being no Beowulf, no Orient spice hungry. Here he lets horizons come quietly to rest. What he fled is passing over, raftered roof and quilted cover, the known street and the known face, the stale place. This is as far as the land goes. Here we are at bay, facing back on the known street and roof, all flight, spent before our birth in building the new towns, letting these horizons come quietly to rest. We have a special pressing need, we of this outer border breed, to climb these hills we cannot flee, to swim in this sea. This is as far as the land goes, here the coast ranges, soft and brown stand down to hold the ocean. Here the winds are named for saints and blow on leaves, small, young, yellow, few, but bound to be ancestral. Nowhere art so still as here, four horizons or so clear. Whatever we can make here, whatever we find, we cannot leave behind. And this is the book I'm reading from, Josephine Miles, Teaching Poet, it's a memoir. Okay, now we're on to the, to the ceremony. So first up, we have Nick Estes, who wasn't able to attend, but sent in a video instead, and Ishmael Reed, who I will be introducing, will uh, talk about him in a few minutes. Ishmael Reed is the author of novels, plays, poetry, and nonfiction. The University of California at Berkeley's distinguished Emeritus Awardee for the year 2020. He has received prizes in every, every category. His novel, Mumbo Jumbo, has been cited by Harold Bloom as one of 500 great books of the Western canon. 
He has received the John D. MacArthur Genius Award and is one of a handful of authors to be nominated for two National Book Awards within the same year. He is a songwriter whose songs have been recorded by Gregory Porter, Cassandra Wilson, Macy Gray, Taj Mahal, and Bobby Womack. His poem, Just Rolling Along, about the 1934 encounter between Bonnie and Clyde and Oakland blues artist L.C. Goodrock and Robinson was chosen for the Best American Poetry 2019. It is also included in Why the Black Hole Sings the Blues, poems 2007 to 2019, published by Dalkey Archive Press in November 2020, also appearing in October 2020 from Archway Books is Reed's ninth and newest play, The Haunting of Lynn manuel Miranda, which premiered at the New York Poets Cafe in May 2019. His second audiobook, The Fool Who Thought Too Much, was released by Audible in November 2020. Reed narrates his first audiobook, Malcolm and Me, 2020, also avail available from Audible. The Terrible Fours, the third novel in his Terrible series, will be published by Baraka Books in 2021. His online literary magazine, Conch, can be found at ishmaelreadpub.com, his author's website at ishmaelreed.org, Ishmael Reed. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> you forgot to mention that uh, he's still getting rejection slips. <laughs> um, hope this doesn't turn out to be uh, evening or afternoon with the Reed family. I, I like to cut this uh, my, my contribution short. And I want to introduce uh, introduce uh, Nick Estes. Clash of, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, the clash of civilizations that resulted in the extermination of millions of indigenous people was a clash between invaders who believed that the earth should be conquered and subdued and those who regarded the earth as a member of the family. The founding fathers among them, Washington, Hamilton, and Jefferson might be regarded as heroes to the settler population. But for the indigenous people, these men were terrorists. Their antecedents, the real founding fathers, the Puritans saw indigenous people as devil worshipers and their descendants have treated them as such. These worldviews continue to clash and result in bloodshed. Nick Estes begins his book, Our History is the Future, with camps established to resist the building of a pipeline that threatened a reservation's water supply. They take their protest to a Black Friday sale designed by psychologists to woo consumers into buying things that they don't need, as one would experiment on laboratory mice. Black Friday is a perfect metaphor for an economic system where if you're not fast and greedy enough, you get trampled. For interrupting a sacred capitalist holiday, they are confronted by armed police whose historic task is to protect private property and to keep Blacks, Latinos, and Native Americans in line. From this episode, Estes visits the historic unsuccessful attempt to exterminate the Native population, a policy that George Washington, who hunted down fugitive slaves and raffled off slave children to pay his debts called extirpation. None of America's heroes is spared by Estes, including Abraham Lincoln, a quote Indian fighter who okayed the hanging of 38 Native American resistance fighters, the largest mass execution in American history. Actually, they killed 39 because one was innocent, but they say, what the hell, you know, get him too. <laughs> the book ends with the triumph of red power. This is a book that was not available to us during our colonial education. Lucky for us, it's available now. It deepens our knowledge of American history. 
All right, um, we're gonna share a video from Nick. Is that time for that now? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Hello, Takiyapi. Nape Chuzapi Chante Washtay. Greetings, uh, relatives and friends. Uh, I greet each and one of you with a handshake and a warm heart in our Lakota greeting. I want to say thank you to all of the readers and the Penn Oakland Prize Committee for selecting Art History of the Future as one of the recipients of the Penn Oakland Award. This comes at a great honor to me as a writer, um, but also as somebody who is deeply embedded within social movements. Because this book itself, you know, wasn't written for just an academic audience. It came from the stories and the movement itself, the stories and history that movements tell. And as a scholar, um, I believe that social movements themselves are legitimate sites of knowledge production. And this book itself was actually written for uh, th those movements themselves. And it goes without saying that this book is dedicated to the water protectors of Standing Rock, those who, for a brief moment in time, uh, showed the world um, what another world looks like. And many of them were beaten, arrested. Some of them are still in prison. You can go to the Water Protector Legal Collective to find out more about um, certain political prisoners who are still behind bars. Some of them have been released, but I think the legacy of Standing Rock really emerged this summer during the George Floyd protests. Many of the water protectors, both indigenous and non-indigenous, participated in those uprisings across uh, the United States. And what this means is that the world that many of these movements are trying to bring into existence hasn't necessarily coalesced into a traditional social movement as we know them in the 60s and the 70s, but nonetheless has created new platforms of struggle, new ways of engaging. Uh, today for indigenous movements, it's the Land Back campaign, the unequivocal statement that the aspirations of indigenous movements is Land Back. And I believe that has always been within our traditions of resistance as indigenous people. It has always been a tradition that is capacious enough to include other traditions, such as the Black radical tradition or the Black radical struggle or the, the freedom movements uh, of various oppressed nations uh, and peoples. This includes an international perspective, something that I bring out in the book itself, that this isn't just a parochial local knowledge, um, the Ocheti Shankoni, but the Ocheti Shankoni, the Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota speaking people, my nation, has always viewed itself in relation to the rest of the world and not just confined to a corner of the planet um, where nothing else matters. And this is very evident in our political traditions. Um, and I would, I would categorize them as both anti-imperialist as well as working class struggles. And indigenous people often aren't seen as participating in working class struggles, but our relation to global systems like capitalism make us um, part of the, the working class struggle because we often, because of the processes of uh, primitive accumulation and capitalist accumulation and extractivism are at the receiving end of the majority of these policies and practices. Right, to build the settler economy that's premised on the death and destruction of indigenous peoples, black boys and lands. And we know now in this era of cataclysmic climate change and global warming that indigenous peoples, indigenous knowledges, indigenous movements are at the forefront of not only overturning the climate regime uh, under the capitalist system, but also providing an alternative. One quarter of land-based environments uh, are still managed by indigenous people. And I believe um, it's a similar about a third 
uh, of marine based environments are managed, so managed by indigenous people or local communities. And in these landscapes or oceanscapes, mountainscapes, desertscapes, environmental degradation and destruction is less severe. In other words, indigenous people protect the land, water, and air. We all need to survive. And that work is often seen as caretaking work or land defense or being a water protector, right? But that work is often uncompensated, uh, unpaid labor. Not that it should be, but it nonetheless raises the, the comparison between other forms of unpaid labor, such as caregiving, often by people who aren't considered you know, formal workers within the formal sector. And many of these people are not men. Um, many of them are women um, or non-men. And they perform necessary functions for the reproduction, the social and biological reproduction of life, but nonetheless aren't seen essential to the capitalist economy, but nonetheless provide the very things that we all need to live. And I would put land defense uh, and stewardship in that category. Um, so, uh, you know, without further ado, thank you so much for this award. Um, I believe that Standing Rock and the Water Protectors at Standing Rock provide a vision of the future that we haven't yet seen uh, uh, come to fruition on a mass scale, but nonetheless, it's something that we are striving for. And this award is just a recognition of not me as an author, but the collective liberation project that we're all engaged in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick Estes, for that video. Next on the list is Seagrin Susan Lane, who Jack Foley will be introducing. Jack Foley has published poetry, criticism, and a 1300 page history of California poetry. 1940 to 2005. He has presented on poetry on radio station KPFA regularly since 1988 and is currently one of the hosts of KPFA's literary program Cover to Cover. He has received two Lifetime Achievement Awards, one from Marquee, Who's Who, and one from the Berkeley Poetry Festival and June 5th, 2010 was declared Jack Foley Day in Berkeley. Jack Foley. Um, okay, I'm up. Has Robert Sward been able to get on? He's here. Oh, great. Okay, fantastic. All right. Um, I'll be introducing two poets today, and I'm very honored to do that and I'm very happy. Uh, I have resented poetry on KPFA for 20 years, 30 years, something like that. Anyway, um, like many others, I was entirely taken with Sigrun Susan Land's book, Salt, poems based on a dream that mollocks and bivalves can suddenly sing. And that was from Goldfish Press in Seattle. How many of you know what a geoduck is? Of those who know that it's a very large edible clam, how many of you have seen a poem about one? Laugh if you will, writes Sigrun Susan Land. I am lovely to some, a giant among clams. <laughs> As the poem progresses, we learn that the geoduck is blind, but nevertheless, I feel the vibrato of rain. These poems, all the poems in Salt, are extraordinarily original, tender, compassionate, and utterly surprising. Ecology can be fun. Lucy Day knows that. Sigmund Susan Lane's poems appear in regional, national, and international publications, including the Amsterdam Quarterly, Crab Creek Review, Ekphrastic Review, Seattle Review, Sing Heavenly Muse, Grain City Review, Malahat Review, and many others. She has received awards for poetry from Seattle and King County Arts Commissions. She's published two chapbooks, Little Bones is the other, Salt is the other, both from Goldfish Press. She is a docent 
at the Fry Art Museum in Seattle, Washington. Uh, and a wonderful writer. Here is Sigrun Susan Lane. Well, first of all, I want to I want to thank you very much, uh, Ken Oakland, for this award. I'm I'm deeply honored to receive it. So I'm going to begin with a poem uh, from Salt, from my little book Salt, um, called How It Begins. In the sea's warm soup, a single cell lit up. A protozoa floated a tiny candle, divided into countless numbers. Eons passed. Anemones came, sponges and jellyfish, echinoderms and ectoderms, with salt in their circuits, salt in their bones. Some crawled, some burrowed, some grew on rocks from newly formed volcanoes. An ocean jungle sprouted, a forest of kelp and seagrass. Now beings with skeletons and fins, silvery fish learned to swim, darted among them. And an amphibian chanced to walk on the cooling earth between the water and the sky with a taste of salt in her mouth salt in her blood. And now I am going to turn to that strange creature that Jack referred to. It's called the gooey duck. And it is a giant clam. Maybe you've seen one. And it has a huge neck, a huge neck that comes out. And here is the gooey duck song. This was a fancy that I had. I thought maybe I could write an opera libretto with all of these very silent, silent mollusks and bivalves suddenly being able to sing. So here is the gooey duck song, if you will. Laugh if you will, I am lovely to some, a giant among clams. Have I said, I love sand, a little thick mud? A blanket of seaweed keeps seagulls away. I live for the tide, it brings me my life. Oh, sweet salt I sing through my long rubber hose, a neck not a nose, a perfect periscope. Although I am blind, I love, I feel the vibrato of rain. One day I will sing basso profundo in a chorus of mollusks and bivalves. We shall sing the great Te Deum in the key of C. And of course there are barnacles on the beaches here many, many barnacles. So here's a poem about the barnacle. In a six-walled shell, white and calcareous as a hollow tooth, I am cemented to the rock on my back. At the tide change, the operculum doors slide open. I send my six pairs of dark feathers to beat like flames against the water to draw the ocean in where I wait like a black robed monk in my cell. And then there's the oyster. Now you may not know this, but oysters begin life as males. Small oysters are males. And then as they mature, they become females. So this is the oyster's song. I dream of the sea, its wash and tickle, of sea rack and sea worms, surf smelt and seaweed. I sing flute songs in all scales. Once I sang tenor, virile and slim. Now full-fleshed and female, I fill octaves with song. My shell is baroque. I lie on a chaise, delicate ruffles fringe my pale body, filtering, feeding me, I grow fat. So sing with me, sisters, of the echo of shell light. Dear little brothers, all oysters together, sing hosannas with me. And then of course we have the mussels. Those are the purple, the deep purple shells on the beach. We are the colonists nestled among the barnacles, indigo purple robed choristers tethered by our green beards to the rocks where we multiply, chant sutras to the turn of the tide. When we open, pale colors of sunrise glow iridescent. 
Sometimes in moonlight, we hum the blues, soft and low. At the awakening, our voices will fill the air, rise like incense to heaven, our shells clicking wildly like castanets. And then there are the mudworms. From deep in the muck, layers of harmonics as if the mud were singing. Mudworms hum as they wriggle and turn. The ground quivers, pulses. And even those without ears, like the worms, listen. And the long dead perk up a bit to hear the worm song with jazz variations. And then on the beach, you can also find these very large moon snails. And the moon snail sings, I'm round as a baker's bun, pale as the luna. I shaped myself as on a wheel, whirl after whirl. I am plowman and predator feared for my appetite. I burrow deep into sand for the butter clam, horse clam and razor. Each bivalve I envelop, smother, drag to the surface, suck out the creature, see all around the drilled shells of my prey. A most murderous mollusk, I sing basso and dark harmony. So the beach is not quite the, the friendly place that we imagine it to be. <laughs> and then there's the horse clam. It's a little bit smaller than the big gooey duck. And its clam doesn't, it, its shells never quite come together. So it's also called the gapper. Here's the horse clam's aria. I'm known for my largesse, called gapper, for my girths exposed. My shell is a tight fit. I share my skirt mantle with two pea crab who clean it. I'm content in this muck. Let the world come to me. Each wave brings newness in the brine. I've tasted the oceans of India and Japan and wants something very nice from the sea of Madagascar. And I'm going to close with a poem that's not in this collection. It's one that's, that's new that I'd like to read to you, I'd like to share it with you. Uh, it's called, If I Were to Meet, after a poem by Grace Nichols. If I were to meet the ghost of my girlhood running past me over hard baked clay of what was not a garden, never became a garden, to the living sound where life begins under the dark docks and light leans in shafts between the planks. I would kneel with her to gaze into the green subterranean sea that swells and surges into mesmerizing depths. Long bronze ribbons of kelp sway. Iridescent fish lighting neon dart among the pilings a flounder stirs in a cloud of sand. In a wave wash, salmon fingerlings whirl, noses to the flow. Darker fish swim along the bottom, their movement like soundless music on the scales. Light shifts, bending it, bearing it up, holding her thoughts. I will leave her as I see her, learning the shapes of this watery world this original universe, peering face down on the dock. Thank you. Thank you, Seguin, Susan Lane, for that lovely poetry. Next, we have Mosh Shane Wynn, who will be introducing Jericho Brown. Jericho Brown was unable to attend today, but he sent a video. Mosh Shane Wynn is the first poet laureate of El Cerrito, California, 2016 to 2018. And her new full length poetry collection is storage unit for the Spirit House on Omnidon. She often collaborates with visual artists, musicians, and other writers. 
Ma Shane Wynn. Thank you, Tennessee. Um, I am honored to present the Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Award to Jericho Brown for his third poetry collection, The Tradition, published by Copper Canyon Press in 2019. Jericho Brown is a Pulitzer Prize winning poet and the recipient of fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard and the National Endowment for the Arts. Brown's first book, Please, on New Issues, 2008, won the American Book Award. His second book, The New Testament, Copper Canyon Press, 2014, won the Anisfeld Wolf Book Award. He is an associate professor and the director of the creative writing program at Emory University. I'd now, now like to share a poem from this powerful and inventive collection, The Tradition. Stand, peace on this planet, or guns glowing hot. We lay there together as if we were getting something done. It felt like planting a garden or planning a meal for a people who still need feeding. All that touching or barely touching, not saying much, the cushion of it, the skin, an occasional sigh, all seemed like work worth mastering. I'm sure somebody died while we made love. Somebody killed somebody black. I thought then of holding you as a political act. I may as well have held myself. We didn't stand for one thought, didn't do a damn thing. And though you left me, I'm glad we didn't. And as Tennessee mentioned, Jericho uh, couldn't join us today, but he sends his deep gratitude and this video acceptance speech, which we'll now see. Thank you. Sorry, let me give that one more try to get the right share there. Hi. Hi, my name is Jericho, and uh, I'm really and uh, I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to speak to you in this way. Uh, I'm really sorry that I could not be there. Uh, hi, my name is Jericho. Hi, my name is. Jer Hi, my name is Jericho, and uh, I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to speak to you in this way. Uh, I'm really sorry that I could not be there uh, with you tonight uh, to honor all of these wonderful writers uh, and to hold hands with you, though virtually, as we stand up for what writing is and what writing can do in this world. Uh, I'm particularly grateful to Penn Oakland and to Mao uh, for understanding writing as a useful tool 
understanding writing as something that actually does work in the world. Um, even if that work is in our hearts, we understand that what we make when we put words on the page changes us and changes those who read the work we make. Um, so big thank you to all of you. By the time you see this, uh, I will be at the Mayo Clinic dealing with some health issues, which is the only reason I am not with you now. Uh, but I wanted you to know that I am grateful uh, and I feel your love and uh, I hope you can feel mine. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you, Jericho Brown, and we hope you get better soon. Next will be Lucille Lang Day, who will be introducing Maya Kosa. Lucille Lang Day is the founder and publisher of Scarlet Tanager Books and the award-winning author of 11 poetry collections, including Birds of San Pancho and Other Poems of Place, which was released by Blue Light Press on November 2020. She has also co-edited two poetry anthologies and published two children's books and a memoir, Married at 14, A True Story, Lucille Lang Day. I'm pleased to, uh, to introduce Maya Kosla, who is receiving a Josephine Miles Literary Award for her poetry collection, All the Fires of Wind and Light, this book was published by 16 Rivers Press. Uh, Maya is a wildlife biologist and writer. She was born in the United Kingdom and was raised there and in India, Bhutan and Myanmar. And these places continue to inform her writing. In addition to all the fires of wind and light, her poetry books include Keelbone, which won the Dorothy Brunsman Poetry Prize, and a chapbook called Heart of the Tearing. Her poems have appeared widely in journals and have been nominated for Pushcart Prizes, and they've also appeared in documentary films. Uh, Maya served as the Poet Laureate of Sonoma County from 2018 to 2020, and during that time, uh, she organized a series of filmed readings to bring Sonoma's communities together after the 2017 fires. Field work grounds her writing. This includes thousands of hours spent in untouched post-fire forests that grow full of life, as well as related studies and field-based interviews with fire scientists. Maya has directed Searching for the Gold Spot, a short film about natural rejuvenation after wildfire in forests of the Sierra Nevada and Cascades. And this year, the Sonoma County Conservation Council has selected her as one of their three environmentalists of the year. Welcome, Maya. Thank you so much. Lucy, and thank you so much, Penn Oakland and Oakland Public Library. This is, uh, I'm so happy to join you all, uh, writers of other writers of nature and writers of incredibly pressing issues of our time. I want to say that for the last, just as a couple of words to add to the beautiful introduction Lucy gave that for the past seven years, I've been uh, lucky enough to spend parts of springs and summers working in uh, documenting post-fire forests that are a healing force of their own if they're left undisturbed. Uh, unfortunately, they're not for the most part. And so this is, I'm hoping uh, all the fires and my other writing is going to be seen as, uh, or is going to make those forests and the life within them, the life force within them visible uh, because it's so needed where it is that particular level of fear and misunderstanding that we have that gives, brings us to accept the destruction that is happening right now. 
including forests uh, being used as coal. Um, anyway, so I'll just, without further ado, I'll share a few of the poems from all the fires, starting with oak, blue oak. A meadow ends where all the perpendiculars of a leafy brown river throw themselves up toward blue. The fruits are olive and ochre, sprays of dark leaves shiver and splash with sun. Lightning scars show where the mane, once shaped by flames, was not lost but reduced to fine fists, oak tissue under sheets of earth, sleeping through the storm and teeth of quick heat. Here it is, the world utterly lovely, despite the anguish, despite endless battles. Meanwhile, you have slipped away to yours. My phone is still again. I could call back. I could babble about this testimony to resilience bent limbs and great elbows of trunk leaning against granite in gestures of pondering and reconciliation. I could share the looping and fluttering of flycatchers, grasses fresh with fog drip and shade, pressed flat where a fox recently turned dog-like circles round and round before settling in. I could hold up my phone among the workings of xylem and phloem, so you could hear that rustling, that liquid flow, scooping minutes out of the heart's rocky, sloping terrain and flowing on as only a river can. Or I could stand still and listen. I have, um, I have to be express thanks to the Sitting Room Community Library and uh, especially uh, JJ Wilson and Karen Peterson, who were really instrumental in helping and me with the Poet Laureate work and sponsoring uh, many, many, many events, even events that were not even in the sitting room. And they, uh, they created one of these broadsides. I have a few still in case anyone wants. This is called Elegy for the Missing. Trees logged in the years after fire are full of birdhouses. The birds will neither be found nor buried. Songs will be replaced by chainsaws and the thunderous slam of legacies. Once in a while, a crack along a midsection of trunk will reveal a home, a bulbous cave carved deep in the pulp. Surfaces pecked and beveled with precision. The ones who lived here, woodpecker, wren, pygmy owl, all are nameless. We are nomads circling the edges of ruin. It is the churning of seasons into noise and slash, truckloads carrying the remains away that extinguishes life, not fire. A lone olive-sided flycatcher sings vespers, corridors, hallways of trees lost to dusk and loose soil. By night, candles sinking to their knees, outpourings of wax congealing to white on a stump. The bulldozers gone, silences stinging our faces with salt and blown dust. Organized disappearance looks simple, clean, the shape of the missing between us, our hands empty, racing like water over our tasks. No time for rituals to commemorate. We crave the ones who cannot be shown the way home. We will not look authority in the eye or say much if we do. But the fallen whose gutted remains are tapped by ravens will leave voices behind. We will walk along shadeless miles, paying our late last respects. The curious who follow will grow to multitudes. Chants will surge across the good country. Sounds will seal these lines. I'm gonna um, close with one more poem and this one sort of an ode to the Redwoods and specifically 
all those beautiful redwoods that have survived the very recent wildfires that were touched, um, began with uh, lightning in Sonoma County. Gigantium, the redwood. To think of you as miles of you, much more than a lone colossus guarding the bare canyon bereft of the rest. As the receiver of skies streaked with soliloquy, runlets seeping down crypts of time and slopes steeped in peelings. As a giant amidst a history of giants sipping waters, pooling in great goblets of basalt below ground, poised on a subterranean table wider than a city, to think of you as story unuttered, a stowage of time anchored by root claw, as clarity filtered, light shattering, angling it to be chopped into slivers and photons, as light eaten, as the growth of built sugars, cone, trunk, dragon-tailed branch, amassed from sunlight in carbon dioxide, as verticals gathering spotted owls and rain, dripping over curtains of insect hovering close, curtains of insects hovering close, to comprehend your gravity as single status, as hope beyond remnant, as assemblage, shadows many stories tall, cooling wet gravel, as Amazons in conference, recalling silences before Miwok fires, metals and flight, as axioms of the vertical world's slow spinning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maya Kosa, that's very nice. Congratulations again. So next will be Jillian Weiss. Cheryl, are you here? I am here. Okay, I'm, are you ready? I'm gonna introduce Tennessee, who's gonna introduce the next um, awardee. Tennessee Reed is the author of seven poetry collections, a memoir, and a novel. She has read her work around the continental United States, Alaska, Hawaii, England, the Netherlands, Spain, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, Israel, and Japan. She's the chairperson of Penn Oakland and the managing ed editor of Conch Magazine. Her seventh poetry collection, uh, Calafia, Burning was published on November the 3rd of 2020. Tennessee. Thank you. Jillian Weiss is a poet, performance artist, and disability rights activist. She is the author of Cyborg Detective, BOA 2019, The Book of Goodbyes, BOA 2013, which won the Isabella Gardner Award and the James Laughlin Award from the Academy of American Poets and the Am Amputee's Guide to Sex, Soft Skulls Press 2007, which was recently reissued in a 10th anniversary edition. Vice identifies as a cyborg and her essays on cyborg identity and disability rights have appeared in the New York Times, Granta and elsewhere. She hosts a series of satirical videos highlighting literary ableism under the persona Tipsy Tullivan. For more information, visit DillianVice.com. Thank you so much, Tennessee. I want to do an image description just in case I have blind kin out there watching this. I am wearing a very strange hat, white and black striped with a glittery cape. And I'm wearing something that's like Braille on my face. It's definitely incorrect because I don't know Braille, but I wish that I did know it. So it's three dots. I'm a white woman. I'm in my office to my left. Um, well, is Toulouse Lautrec a scarf? I don't know if it comes up on the screen though. That might not be in the frame. And then behind me are a pair of crutches. I have taken them from the medical look into the bondage look. 
And I'm also working on a series called Unfamous Snow Globe. So those are in the back. I want to thank Penn Oakland and the Oakland Public Library. Thanks to my editor at BOA Editions, Peter Connors, for publishing this book that won this award. And I want to thank my partner, Josh Bell, for weathering this pandemic with me, plus 10 years of love and weather. And I want to shout out to the Crip queers in the audience, the bisexual, disabled women, trans women, indies, the polyamorous and relationship anarchists. And how could I not thank the people who lift me up with their work and cultural activism, including Ishmael Reed and Tennessee Reed, Jim Ferris, Petra Cuppers, Alice Wong, Khadijah Queen, Rosemary Garland Thompson, Constance Merritt, Margaret Price, and Brenda Brueggemann, just to name a few. This is a huge deal for me for several reasons. For one thing, the award is for multicultural work and therefore recognizes disability as culture. For another, the award is named after Josephine Miles or Joe Miles to her friends, and she is an icon to me, poet, theorist, classifier of language, innovator, activist. Growing up disabled, Josephine Miles encountered obstacles. In high school, she wanted to take poetry classes, but all the classes were held on the third floor and there was no elevator. So instead she took math and science on the first floor. She wrote a poem called To Dr. Edwards on going to the third floor. This resonates because I was recently invited to hold a prestigious position at a small liberal arts college in the Northeast as a visiting writer. And while Clemson supported me with this opportunity, I was surprised to find out the Department of English at this small liberal arts college had no elevator to the third floor where it was located. You can teach in the library, they said to me. I knew that I would have to decline the position even though I wanted it because it's been 93 years since Josephine Miles wrote that poem and I will not accept the same conditions that she had to accept. There is joy in winning this award as of course there is the vanity of it which I am not immune to. And the joy of being disabled and a writer and an artist alongside my ancestors like Josephine Miles and HD and Richard Brodigan and who knows, maybe even Sappho. And there's the joy of the disabled writers who are coming up right now, who are in colleges across the country or outside the academy, writing their poems from their beds with their heating pads and their prescription pills and whatever way works for them, for us. It is my job to make sure they know that this award is theirs, it is ours, it belongs to us, and it signals that things are changing and our disabled writing is a cultural revolution. I will read poems from Cyborg Detective. Here's one, I want your facts. I want to be disability for you, make new signs for you. They are saying things about us online in their underwear. The listserv is blowing up ableist verse, ableist verse, and I'm talking to you. I'm a green circle for you, and there you go again into my cover letters. Pinned your last dispatch to my outlook so every day starts with you. Got your text, got your chat, got your tweet, got you all over me. I wanna be disability for you and capital crawl for you and accommodate you. I didn't know Emily Dickinson was disabled till not too long ago. I don't know if people just hid it from me or I wasn't reading enough. But as soon as I found out, I had to write about it, of course. So this is variation on the disabled poet, Emily Dickinson's number 745. You know that poem as renunciation is a piercing virtue. 
I'm not sure what happened in the room with the view, except I took to you in a new way. Please wait, I'm not finished. Let me be, what's your word? Foolish. Now bring in the nay, you never intended, never meant it. Besides, we have good God, good lives without each other. Um, I want to read a poem that Tennessee took for Conch Magazine, the newest issue, which is just out. I had the pleasure of reading with Tennessee and Ishmael at Third Man Records, and um, they asked if they could publish this poem called Poetry Entrance Exam. And when I wrote the poem, I was thinking of Ishmael Reed's line from his novel, Flight to Canada, what good is words? Words built the world. Poetry entrance exam. Can you climb the stairs at the KGB bar? Which is more important, sound or image? Can you name any disabled poets at the opening ceremony of the Dodge Poetry Festival? at the National Books, at the Pulitzers? Who are you? Who do you think you are? Can you read lips from the back row? Can you stand outside a while? We really love this building. I had the pleasure of working with a disabled publisher for the very first time that I know of, because often people are disabled and you don't know it, they don't know it, or they don't want to say it. Um, but in this case, Susie runs Red Mare Press, and she just put out this chat book. Uh, the chat book is called Give It to Alfie Tonight. I'd like to read from it. Some new words. This is Ashley Shu just invented the word Triborg. No, excuse me. I invented that word. Cryborg is the word she invented. Now, Ashley Shu is a techno scientist and writes incredible things. It's coming up with words all the time. Another of her words is techno ableism. Ashley Shu just invented the word cryborg. How to use it in a sentence. Elon Musk is such a cryborg when we critique Neuralink. Don't be a cryborg about it. Just fucking provide access. After Stephen Hawking died, all the cryborgs came out like, he's walking in heaven. Enough with your cryborg protest. We don't care that you think the word ableist is too harsh for your being actually an ableist. Poet, do your job. Put this word into circulation. Code it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jillian Weiss. Next, we have Robert Mailer Anderson, who will be saying a few words about Gia Tolentino. Robert Mailer Anderson is a ninth generation native Californio, author of the best selling novel Boonville, the play The Death of Teddy Ballgame, and co writer of the graphic novel and screenplay Windows on the World among other literary works. In addition, he is an activist, multiple Grammy nominated music producer, a contributor to the Anderson Valley Advertiser for over 35 years, and recipient of the 2016 San Francisco Arts Medallion, Robert Mailer Anderson. Thank you. Um... I'm very happy to present the Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Award to Gia Tolentino's Trick Mirror, Reflections on Self-Delusion. Uh, it's a fantastic book of important and timely essays. And Tolentino has the uncanny ability to get to the heart of current matters and name the seemingly unnameable things in our anxiety-filled lives and crux of disparate problems that have us up at 2 a.m. terrified or shaking our heads and fists as we watch the news our culture and our country explode. Um, I'm not alone in my admiration here as, uh, and, and, and as, as Tolentino recently won a 2020 Whiting Award for nonfiction. Um, I thought that she was gonna be able to, to attend, uh, she's not. So I, I'd like to also say 
uh, add a little bit of the criticism that I read recently that I found to be completely true is the Washington Post said that she's the, the millennial Susan Sontag, a brilliant voice in cultural criticism. And Fulcher said, it isn't hyperbole to say that New Yorker staff writer Gina Tolentino could be the Joan Didion of our time, writing about feminism, vaping, popular music, religion, and sexual assault with equal amounts of ease and insight. In her debut collection, the writer unveils nine new pieces that help cement her place in the SAS canon. She's an expert in the sweet spot where contemporary politics and youth culture meet and make out. Um, I also saw uh, that Zadie Smith, who I, I much admire, also said, it's easy to write about things as you wish they were, or as others tell you they might be. It's much harder to think for yourself with the minimum of self-delusion. It's even harder to achieve in a moment like this, when our thoughts are subject to unprecedented manipulation, monetization, and surveillance. Yet Tolentino has managed to tell many inconvenient truths in Trick Mirror and in enviable style. It filled me with hope. Uh, the essay filled me with hope too, and, and, and many questions and, and many conversations that I've been able to share with people. So I'm very happy to both give and accept this Josephine Miles Award on behalf of Gia Tolentino. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, next will be Duith Cody, who will be introducing um, Stephanie McCurry. Judith Cody a poet, writer, and photographer, has a poem in the Smithsonian Institute, has won national awards and honors from the Atlantic, Amelia, Pablo Neruda Prize for Poetry, Soul Making Keats Literary Competition, Robert Frost Foundation's Director Shortlist, and she's published in over 160 journals. Books include Garden on an Alien Star System, Vivian Fine, a biobibliography, Eight Frames Eight, and in photography, Cody's World War II B-17 photo essays ranked number one in the world on Google, Judith Cody. Sorry, I needed to unmute, I, sorry about that. Uh, I really want to talk about this wonderful book I came across kind of by accident, and I'm glad, so happy I did. It's Woman's War by Stephanie McCurry. And what I want to say is that if you remember most of the major studio war movies from past decades, you'll recall that almost all the leading characters are male, of course. Often, one or two attractive women are added to the cast for what seems like a few minutes of romantic adventure in the midst of the real war being portrayed. This scenario is often true of novels and worse yet of historical text where most of the women depicted are insignificant or pretty little beings bouncing around to the wars being fought. Yet the actual truth of women's activities during wars is that women have been important and many, many times even critical fighters in often wars as Stephanie McCurry proves in her remarkable, heavily documented book detailing the substantial female participation in our own American Civil War. Stephanie poignantly confesses in her preface how, quote, she always felt particular shame in conceding to be taught a history with no women in it, as if women never lived or mattered in the making of that history, unquote. She will vastly alter the reader's concept of women's history in the Civil War with her amazing and even shocking new book, thereby saving many future generations the specific shame of having no place in war history. Stephanie's background. Stephanie is a professor of American history at Columbia University. One of Stephanie's books, Confederate Reckoning, Power and Politics in the Civil War South, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. She also received a Guggenheim Fellowship. Stephanie was born in Belfast, Northern Ireland. She has two children and lives in New York City. Her website is stephaniemccurry.com. Very interesting too. Stephanie. Good afternoon, everybody from New York. Can you hear me okay? I just wanna say how moved I am by these whole events of the evening about your organization and all you do every year. 
to lift writers up and recognize their work. I don't know the last time that I've been at an event where so many poets were honored in one evening. And it's, I have to say as an Irish person that hits very close to the heart. So I wanna thank Judith Cody for picking this book out of somewhere <laughs> and all the members of Penn Oakland um, for including me in, and recognizing my work um, in this pathbreaking organization and in the company with these other incredible writers. And as a professor and a teacher, it's very special to be recognized as a writer. So thank you so much for putting me in that company. Um, at Judith's suggestion, I thought I would use my few minutes to tell you a little bit about the book. We have so little time to read and maybe it would be interesting to hear a little bit um, about how I came to write it. It is an odd kind of book um, and you're helping me embrace its oddness. Judith's uh, introduction has gone a long way to that. I am a scholar and a historian of the 19th century United States. I studied things like the South, slavery and emancipation, the Civil War uh, and emancipation. But really underneath all of that, for me, there's only ever one topic and that's relations of power and how they work. That's what interests me. War, violence, politics, legitimacy, these things are my preoccupations and they always have been. And power between men and women, something integral to all of the rest, but much harder to explain. And I have written about these things many different ways over the years, but I have to confess, maybe because it's academia, it forces you to keep a distance between, from the personal historical experience that informs the work. And so this book, Women's War, is special and a little odd for me because it's the first time I really tried to confront this head on what was the personal experience that makes the scholar? Um, and I tried to articulate the connection between my personal and scholarly selves. And that personal story does in fact have a lot to do with why I would write a book like this about women in war. And as Judith mentioned, I grew up in Belfast in Northern Ireland on the Catholic side of the line uh, during the Troubles, as we Irish people call the Civil War that broke out in the late 1960s, basically over the legitimacy of continued British rule. And I grew up in a war zone on the Falls Road, and I came of age and into political awareness under British military occupation. I have to say there's nothing about that that I would ever change. It was an education that has shaped me and would anyone especially in education about what happens when people don't have the political power to force change democratically, when they turn to violence to do what they can't do electorally, and also painfully about the limits of human agency, how many times people lose even when they're on the right side. And I learned other things too as a kid watching that, especially about whose struggle it was. So, you know, it was the late 1960s and early 70s. Mine was a working class nationalist community um, dominated by men in the most explicit kind of way. But even so, there was no doubt about women's involvement, as it was called, in the movement. And you can see that if you ever go to Belfast and see the political murals on the walls where the names of women are listed along with the names of men commemorating people who gave their lives in the cause of Irish freedom, as those murals say. So that was the way I grew up and all of that stayed with me. And like a lot of people from Ireland and Northern Ireland, I was forced out into the diaspora to Canada and then to the United States. But that shaping influence was, was with me um, and it stayed with me. Uh, the knowledge, which in fact is common to many people in many different parts of the world and those who come from the kind of social movements we've been talking about in the United States today, the knowledge that women are not bystanders to these movements, to these histories, they are passionate parties to their people's struggle. So I can't recognize histories of war that leave women out, and for sure I would never write one. But this is how histories of war are written, as Judith said, and how movies of war are made. They're made with no women in them. And so this time I wanted to challenge that head on. So Women's War is about the American Civil War and it meets all the standards of academic scholarship and documentation, but at a deeper level and in ways that matter to me, it's also about what I think of as the meta problem of women in war. And that's the really problematic 
assumption that women are outside war, that war is a men's game, it's a men's activity. The idea that women are outside of war is as old as Antigone, if you think of Sophocles' play. And it lasts through Western civilization, the idea that women belong to the realm of the family uh, and kinship, not citizenship and the state, that women's domain is peace, it is not war. And this is an incredibly powerful idea. You can see it in the association of gender and innocence in the international laws of war, for example. And it undergirds the concept of civilian immunity in war. The, the prototype of the um, innocent non-combatant is a woman. So when it came to the American Civil War, that fiction that women are outside war was and is a powerful one. It shaped both the war itself and the way people write about it and still write about it. It's the idea, as one soldier put it, that we don't make war on women and children. Women, he said to his wife, he wrote in a letter to his wife, are entitled to protection even if they are the wives and daughters of rebels. So it was a Union soldier talking about pro-slavery Confederates. There's a great deal at stake in that idea that women are entitled to protection. It represents an investment in the gender order itself, and it's very desirable to most men, the hierarchies and asymmetries of it. But also, uh, it's very central to the idea of limiting destruction in war. Um, and it helps explain the reluctance of soldiers during war to confront the role of enemy women when wars are ongoing, and also the need to forget or deny their, this really disturbing knowledge when wars are over. It explains part of the conservatism of post-war societies. And yet in every war that I know of, in the modern period at least, and as I demonstrate here in terms of the American Civil War, during wars, governments and armies are forced to acknowledge women's role as enemies who matter during the conflict. And so in this book, I look at it in three different ways. First, at how at white Confederate women who join guerrilla and partisan forces that inflict military damage on the Union Army and how the Union Army responds. The second part of the book looks at enslaved African-American women who defied their owners and became fugitives during the war and who also defied the Union Army to pursue a war for their own freedom and that of their children during that conflict in the 1860s. And then the last part of the book looks at one very elite white Southern woman, a slaveholding woman, whose account of the process of reconstructing her life in the aftermath of the war, in the ruins of the slave South and after emancipation, gives us a profound insight into the new terms of white supremacy in the post-Civil War United States. So this is why it mattered to me to write this book. It was finally a moment when my past and personal self and my scholarly self were brought together in one project and I wanted to tackle fictions about women in war to challenge the writing, out, the writing out of women, including by historians, and to insist on the value of women's perspective, perspectives on war and the attempts, often failed attempts, to make peace in the aftermath of war. So let me thank you again for allowing me to join this event tonight and for this uh, amazing honor. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie McCurry. This now concludes the Josephine Miles Award. It is now time to present the Adele Foley Award, the Gary Webb Anti-Censorship Award, and the Reginald Lockett Lifetime Achievement Award. Ishmael Reed will be saying some uh, words on behalf of Amarosa, excuse me, the late Henry Dumas. Right. Can you yeah. hear me? Okay. <clears throat> Besides being an excellent poet, without uh, Eugene Redmond's book, Professor Redmond's book, Drum Voices, the Black Arts would have disappeared as a local hometown movement. Redmond nationalized the movement and through powerful, and though powerful establishment forces attempted to bury it, 
less writers from other ethnic movements got ideas, Redmond has lived to see its revival. Eugene Redmond is a poet laureate of East St. Louis, emeritus professor of English, founding editor of the drum, the very valuable uh, Drum Voices Review, and former chairman of creative writing at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. He is the author and editor of 25 volumes of poetry, collections of diverse writings, plays for stage and television, and posthumously published works of Henry Dumas. Redmond read a poem at Maya Angelou's 70th birthday gala, 1998, hosted by Oprah Winfrey. In April of 2008, his photo exhibit, 80 Moods of Maya, was featured at Angelou's 80th birthday party in Palm Beach, Florida. The year 2008 also capped a long line of awards and accolades when he received an honorary doctor of humane letters degree from SIUE. Addition, additionally, Redmond has won an American Book Award for his book, The Eye in the Ceiling, American Literature and Cultural Association, a Stay in the Course Award from ETA of Chicago, and uh, the St. Louis American Foundation's Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, he is a real uh, cultural mover and shaker and indispensable to American writing and a pioneer of the revolution that took place in American letters beginning with the 1960s. One that the New York Times Book Review has yet to acknowledge. <laughs> the New York Review of Books and all the other Anglophile and Francophile institutions. <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> it is through the efforts of his widow, Dolores Dumas, and Eugene Redmond as executor of the Dumas estate, that Henry Dumas, subjected to a cultural assassination by the notorious Tonton NYPD at the age of 33, will not be lost to us. So I want to introduce Eugene Redmond, who will accept an award for the late Henry Dumas. I don't think he's here. Is he waiting to get in or anything? No, I don't see him on the waiting list. OK, well, why don't you uh, proceed? OK, so uh, next we will move on to the Gary Webb Anti-Censorship Award, which was awarded to Amarosa Manigault Newman. OK, here I am again. Look at your title of us. <clears throat> OK, and uh, Ms. Newman's not able to make it either, but I just, just want to make a remark about her contribution. Okay, uh, anybody who has read Black Folklore, as I have, understands that Donald Trump's presidency began to unravel when he called Black women bitches. Now the end experienced by cruel plantation owners of legend has happened to him. He has lost his mind. And like those Blacks who lived in the big house, who kept a diary of the goings on, if the White House is now in disarray as a result of feuding factions, Omarosa Newman was among the first to predict its end with her book, Unhinged, an insider's account of the Trump White House. She confronted the child president when powerful men were too, when powerful men were too cowardly to do the job. Her revelations earned her the wrath of the bully president's White House. 
They sought to humiliate her by escorting her out of the building. She was unable to properly pack her office, denying her access to important paperwork. According to Times, after being let go from her position, Mrs. Newman was required to submit a report confirming various financial and travel matters. Without the files, however, she was unable to complete the form and the White House was allegedly slow to provide them. The Trump administration began legal action against uh, Ms. Newman, Mrs. Newman, which her attorneys claim are due to the revelations in her book. The book revealed her first hand experience as a black woman working under the current administration and portrayed the president of, excuse me, the former president of the United States as a racist and a misogynist with declining mental health. The president responded by calling her a dog. Seems that the dog had the last bark. For her triumph over censorship, we are proud to present Mrs. Amarosa Newman with Auckland, excuse me, Auckland, I guess I say Auckland, what's the matter, I'm tired. Auckland's Anti-Censorship Award for her book, Unhinged. Thank you, Ishmael Reed, for those uh, words on Amarosa Monigal Newman. And now we're on to the Lifetime Achievement Award, Reginald Lockett Lifetime Achievement Award, who will be going to two winners, Thomas Sanchez and Robert Sward. Robert Mailer Anderson, can you say some words about Thomas Sanchez for us, please? Uh, absolutely. Um, it's a great honor to present the Penn Oakland Reginald Lockett Lifetime Achievement Award to an Oakland native, Tomas Sanchez. Tomas has been an uncompromising powerhouse of a writer and activist for his entire career, who's devoted his life to language and storytelling, to creating resonant sentences written large from his hard-earned experience, from his seemingly bottomless imagination, from grace and beauty itself, from endless hours that somehow swelled into decades spent honing his craft, all the soul-wracking labor of attempting to fully bear witness and translate this tragic comedy of humanity into epic tales full of raging truth, memorable characters, and blazing poetry. He's the author of six time-honored novels translated internationally, published by Penn Random House, Knopf Vintage, the first of which is the masterpiece, Rabbit Boss. Hailed as a landmark of our literature by Vanity Fair, listed by State Librarian of California, Emeritus Kevin Starr as one of the three or four finest novels ever to be set in California, and is cited by Native American historian Vine Deloria to be etched in unforgettable prose. It also has one of the most stunning openings of any novel I've ever read, in which in 1846, a doomed Washoe hunter in Tahoe gets his first sight of the white man, burning into his and his tribe's consciousness the powerful notion that the white man is a cannibal. He has just crossed paths with the Donner Party. Sancho is, is also the author of King Bongo, which our San Francisco Chronicle called Big Picture Epic Storytelling, the entire historical and cross-cultural immensity of Havana. Mile Zero, an intense bulging novel of Key West, described by the LA Times as a magnificent tapestry, forges a new world vision rich in cultural and literary intertextuality of Steinbeck and Cervantes. A holy terror of a book, immense power and passion about the end of the American road, said the Washington Post. Zoot Suit Murders, a starkly revisionist view of the American melting pot set in 1940s wartime Los Angeles, it explores a chaotic world of political, political hysteria, tough barrio gangs, bizarre religious cults, and undercover government agents. Maybe one of the best home front novels of World War II, said the Los Angeles Times. Day of the Bees, which reveals the hidden life of a French woman transformed from an artist's muse into a resistance fighter, was called a novel of unforgettable power on love and war, intimate destinies and great history, the sources of art and freedom by Le Monde. American Tropic, 
is a fever dream eco thriller, fury, incandescent, a sense of near apocalyptic doom, wrote Bookless. Tomas Sanchez has been awarded grants from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Guggenheim Foundation, and was honored by the French Republic as a chevalier. That's why I can't, you know what? I went to France for a year. I still can't, can't even, can't even get home in a cab. Chevrolet de Arts and Letters. Uh, because he could not be here, he asked me to read the following. I'm a fifth generation California born in Oakland, whose family dates back to the gold rush. During World War II, my father sailed out from under the Golden Gate Bridge and was killed at the age 21 at the Battle of Tarawa. I question, is this country still worth fighting and dying for? What are its ideals? I hold freedom of speech and liberty to create from a visionary imagination as high aspirational ideals. These ideals were revealed to me at age 12 when confined to an orphanage boarding school with unjustly treated Native Americans, whites, blacks, and Latinos. We boys all faced the same adversary. We were in that brief moment in time as one, proverbial brothers under the skin. In the 1960s, as a young man, I was involved in early San Francisco civil rights protests, in UC Berkeley's free speech movement, in the first United Farm Workers strikes, in the student teacher strike at San Francisco State University, where SWAT teams battered students bloody before the library the place that held the wisdom of ages in books. America in the 1960s seemed a burning house. If I could run from that house, save one thing, what would it be? For me, it was the freedom to create, to animate my own destiny. I refused to let go of being that young boy who believed all colors can shine their unique truth and bear accountable witness. Tomas Sanchez is an inspiration. He's a dear friend. He's my brother in arms, a fellow Californian and a great spirit and a great writer. It's with great honor that I accept the award on his behalf. Thank you. And all the members of Penn Oakland. Thank you, Robert Mailer Anderson. Last but not least will be Robert Sward. Jack Foley, will you do us the honor of introducing him, please? Absolutely. Uh... I don't know if Jillian's still here, but if she is, I studied with uh, Josephine Miles and knew her as a friend. And when my son, Sean, was born, she found out about it and sent him a postcard that said, Dear Sean, give your dad a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Miles. And also a dear friend of mine was Larry Agner, who was certainly a deserved. Oh, wonderful, wonderful poet. Yeah. I brought Larry, I brought Larry places. I brought him to his the last film he ever saw, which was mm -hmm. the most one. And he came out and he said, we're good, which was high <laughs> praise for Larry. <laughs> he, was, he was an amazing man. Awesome, <laughs> awesome. So let me go on to Robert Sword, but I wanted to mention that to you. I very much enjoyed your presentation and it reminded me of those two people so much. Yeah, thank you. Joe jo was a great teacher. And I she came, somebody carries her in, she, she, it's just nothing. You know, yeah. this tiny body, big head, but tiny body, puts her in a chair and you've completely forgotten about it two minutes after she starts to talk. She was just amazing. And she had a lot to say. Anyway, Robert Sword, I wanna make a, a, a sort of statement while uh, introducing him. If we cast our historical net wide enough, we begin to believe that poetry has been usurped by prose. But it is possible to reverse the usurpation, to write something that seems almost to be prose until, until it's been transformed and has acquired, despite its prosaic elements, the power of a poem. Free verse is the laboratory in which this alchemy now usually takes place. William Carlos Williams was a great master. But it's of course also possible for the transformation to occur in the realm of traditional verse. Poetry is not a form. It's the accomplishment of linguistic transformation. The magic the poet performs is real, but it's nothing other than the creation of poetry. Born and raised in Chicago, Robert Sward served in the US Navy in the combat zone during the Korean War in 1951 to 53, and later worked for CBC Radio and as book reviewer and feature writer for the Toronto Star and the Globe and Mail. He was also the world's skinniest Santa Claus. I wrote this about him. 
There is wisdom in Robert Swartz's poetry, but it's the kind of wisdom that we call crazy. Laughter is the mysterious pathway to spiritual awareness. The final message of this work is not to transcend intense contradiction or doubleness, as Swartz would say, but to live deeply, even joyously within it. Lives tumble into lives. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Robert Sword, co-winner of this year's Lifetime Achievement Award. Robert. There we go. Clear? Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much. And uh, for, to Penn Oakland, I, I bless you. I'm, I'm very grateful. I'm very pleased. And to, for Jack and Lucy in particular. Um, I'm going to read a few poems in my father's voice. Um, my dad was uh, born in Russia, Orthodox Jew, became a, a podiatrist and a Rosicrucian, but he, as time, time went on. So I would see dad, and uh, this is art supports the fitting. Greets me in the waiting room, father with waxed five eyelid shoes, son too with spit shine, five eyelid shoes. This is how I was brought up. I do it to show respect, value your feet. Okay, unsock those feet of yours, he says. Let's see the felons. I unlace my four slimes, moist feet emerging from the cave of leather. Father holds up art supports, curved knife in hand. He shakes his head as he trims, just so. Remind me, why do I need these things, I ask? Weak ankles and spine, he says. Feet, poor posture. Your feet are fine. Truth is, you should be more like your feet. Robust, healthy feet. Take a lesson from your feet, he says. Feet appreciate, custom made. No Dr. Scholl's for these feet. Slips in the inserts, art support like a shoe. Inside a shoe, leather inside leather. Every step I take, you're gonna be there, I say. Every step, he says, every step of the way. This is called God is in the cracks. Again, in my father's voice. Just a tiny crack separates this world from the next. And you step over it every day. God is in the cracks. Foot propped up, nurse hovering, phone ringing. Relax and breathe from your heels. Now that's breathing. So tell me, have you enrolled yet? Enrolled in the Illinois College of Podiatry. Dad, I have a job. I teach. Ha. Ah, well, I'm a man of the lower extremities. Dad, I'm 43. See? So what? I'm 80. I knew you before you began wearing shoes. Too good for feet? He asked. I, me, mine. That's all I get from your poetry. Your words lack feet. Forget the mind. Mind is all over the place. There's no support. You want me to be proud of you? Be a footman. Here, son, he says handing me back my shoes. Try walking in these, art supports. Now there's a subject. Someday you'll write about art supports. <clears throat> More in that uh, sequence with the, with the father. Um, a man needs a place to stand. <clears throat> Snap out of it, son. Yes, of course I'm dead. But you think I've left the world? Then how come you're stalking to me? New, ask yourself, how is this possible? Listen to me, there's more good news. That's right, death doesn't separate you from God. This is a surprise. You were thinking there's something to find, to fear. Anyway, wait till you die, son, you'll see. We never entirely leave the world, and there's no there to leave. There's hardly a here. And you, Lindnick, 
You just think you have a body. Still, you can't chase the invisible. Do that and you'll end up everywhere. And then what? A man needs a place to stand. This is from a, this new book, um, All That I Have Not Made, which uh, just came out uh, a few weeks ago. And this is called Life is Its Own Afterlife. Enough already. Born, born all you want. What good will it do? Truth is, I feel great, son, never better. So what if I'm invisible? So what if I'm dead? You don't need a body to be a mensch, a man of substance. Ah, but here with a body, at least, you've got some privacy. Without a body, you can't hide anything. There's more sun. And bad news for you, this will surprise you. When you die, one of the first questions God asks is, did you marry? Turns out God, after he created the world, the rest of the time he spent making marriages. So a couple, when they meet, it's beshirt. It was meant to be. That's so, that's how together they fulfill their destiny. But divorce, that they don't allow. So you won't be coming. But thank God for what you've got. What are you missing? Not much. There is no afterlife, not really. That's right, son. Life is its own afterlife. And I think I'm going to wrap up the father poems. Um, can, can you see me okay? Jack, are we, we're on? Okay, this is, a, this is a father. Again, in the father's voice. Where are you going? That you don't know, do you? Yes, it's me. Who else would it be? You think I don't see what you're up to? Wait, I'm not finished. He's in such a hurry to leave, but he doesn't know the address. Walk, walk, that he knows, the easy part. How will you end up? You think I'm hard on you? I'm not hard enough. Where do they come from? Smart guys like you, and where do they go? Head at one end, feet at another. What kind of creature is this? A sugar, a crazy man. Two billion times in a lifetime, it beats the heart. And the brain, three and a quarter pounds. 200 billion neurons, and for what? To walk, what, again? Walks out on a wife, walks out on a child. You, I didn't walk out on, for you I stayed. Even now, I may be dead, that's true, but I'm not going anywhere. This is a father. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Robert Sward. Eugene Redmond has joined the meeting, so he'd like to say a few words. Sure. Are you there? I'm here. Okay, now I'm talking about Robert, I mean, excuse me, Red, Eugene Redmond. Hello, everyone. And uh, I'm especially grateful to uh, uh, the, oh, this wonderful institution organization, nation that Ishmael Reed and cohorts have founded out there. And I'm speaking from the heart of the heart of the country in uh, the Oakland, in the Bay Area <clears throat> um, of the country, uh, one that is uh, the uh, Penn Oakland, uh, before Columbus Foundation, the ABA uh, flourishes now in uh, across the globe. Um, I've been working with the work of Henry Dumas uh, for 52 years. <clears throat> and I could take the rest of the evening into the morning listing people 
who uh, are part of what Toni Morrison called the cult of Henry Duma and what Jane Cortez referred to as the Henry Duma movement. And I speak of the man whom James Baldwin and Dr. Joyce Ladner gave a first prize in a fiction writing contest sponsored by the Black Scholar magazine. Um, Morrison called him a genius, an absolute genius. Um, he had 33 years on the planet, but while he was here, again, Morrison notes, he wrote the quality and quantity of poetry and prose uh, that are rarely achieved in several lifetimes. For her, it was arguably <laughs> that. Um, Dumas lived in several worlds, one of which was his sons, um, David and Michael, who were under 10 years old when he was shot to death in May of 19, <coughs> excuse me, of 1968. Uh, a favorite poem of his uh, was My Little Boy. My Little Boy Speaks with an Accent. I must remember to reach my head down one day and ask him the name of the country he comes from. I like his accent. So much said. A poem called America. If an eagle be imprisoned on the back of a coin, that coin will flip, that corn will sputter, that corn will fly, but the eagle will never fly. Tanahisi Coates selected one of Dumas' poems to open Black Panther Marvel Comics number three. Um, the poem is called Root Song. And what Tanahisi said was that what stunned him about it was how Henry Ank Ank Samu could, using Black myth, Build a great image of Black people from pre Egypt Blackness through colonialism and beyond bondage or beyond enslavement. That's his great achievement. Of course, that's one of Ishmael Reed's great achievements is to take those worlds and make them work for you. Make them, use them to portray you as a human being, approaching other civilizations as a civilization, and indeed noting that the civilizations 
that you're speaking of and confronting came from you. A lot of what he uh, Dumas did was what he did, how he worked with uh, neologisms. I have a 49 word poem of my own, which comes from a book uh, called Arkansas and Memoirs. And the form is influenced by Henry's work. It's called Quan Saba. And here are the 49 words. Dumas' rebirth and word deed. Awake as a quake, dreaming Henry wrought Hank into Ankh. Dumas into Samu. Named his poems Sabas and I kept his friends, Hedda and Janoa, his settings, Sweetwater and Harlem, his vessels, Afrohorn and Soul Boat, his heroes, Probe and Sun Rock, and his brothers, Fawn and cosmic arrows. Um, I don't want to end without mentioning some of the people. I've already mentioned uh, Ishmael, I've mentioned Tony Morrison, but Quincy Troop, who brought Dumas' attention to Morrison and put her in touch with me, uh, put us together a very serious player in all of this. The late James Baldwin, the late John Oliver Killen, the late John A. William, Eleanor Traylor, Clyde Taylor, Darlene Roy, Sherman Fowler, his protege at the Experiment in Higher Education where Dumai and I taught and where we met and uh, became fast friends in 10 months. I only knew him two months. I mean, 10 months, I'm sorry. Uh, we became fast friends. And uh, I could go on and on and on speaking about him, Gwendolyn Brooks, Haki Armado Buti, Norman Jordan. I mentioned Dr. Uh, Joyce Ladner. Oh, Michael Castro, the cult, the movement that helped push his work, that kept pushing his work out into a reading public to the extent that very recently I received the letter from Faber and Faber in Britain. That's what it's culminated in 52 years and they want to publish not just one book, but the letter said something like that we'd like several years of a relationship between us and his work. And it's, it's just owed to all the people I've mentioned and hundreds and hundreds of people, thousands, maybe that I, I, I can't mention, I can't, I can't even recall their names, but it's been worth it. Uh, it's been good. And when you read a story, Ark of Bone, which is his signal work, probably his most famous work, most iconic work, Ark of Bones, or you read the Metagenesis of Sun Ra, or you read, uh, Will the Circle Be Unbroken? You understand the incredible gifts and magic of this man. You know, the, the forerunner of what now is popular all over the globe, Afrofuturism, or what I call African futurism. And again, Ishmael Reed is one of the pioneers of 
of that idea, of that concept, of that philosophy, where you actually coexist with all the times that you have been here and all the times that you will be here. <laughs> Thank you again for, for this great, great work. And, and I've received a couple of American Book, book Awards from uh, Penn Oakland and the, before um, uh, Columbus Foundation. And I am extremely grateful for that. And to see this kind of uh, great work still flourishing. I mean, this is, this is gold. This is our goal. You know, the people, you know, how, what, what a better time for this to be showing, for this to be uh, being presented, if all of you know what I'm talking about. You know, Corona racial virus. <laughs> Thank you very much. Love you all. Thank you, Eugene Redmond. Before we wrap up the ceremony, Mr. Ishmael Reed would like to say a few words about the late Miguel Algarin. Oh, yes. I can't hear. All right, I'm on now. I'm on. Okay. Uh, Eugene Redmond is somebody who never worked, runs out of eloquent golden words. And we want to salute somebody else. But before I do that, I want to tell uh, Stephanie McCurry that I have a copy of your book, Confederate Reckoning. And it was a delight to read a book about the Civil War that includes uh, everyday people instead of books by these traitor, about these traitors. <laughs> and I would say that. Um, Ms. McMurray is part of a uprising against the old boy historical establishment, like John Meacham, who said that uh, Andrew Jackson, who's like the Himmler of Native American policy was, quote, imperfect. And Mr. Meacham also said that slavery lasted 90 years, and then he corrected himself and said 100 years. And so that's the kind of mentality that Ms. McMurray and others are sort of like up in part of an upheaval against the lies that we've been taught over the, over the decades. And uh, as a matter of fact, I got a lot of flack for daring to question uh, Alexander Hamilton's credentials as an abolitionist. Now the whole thing's all over now because the, 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 the scholar historic site said that not only was, was he a slave trader, but presented receipts of the actual transactions where he sold people and sold them on behalf of others. So the women historians were the first ones to expose Alexander Hamilton, the slave trader. Miguel Algarin, there are two stories about him in the Times today. There's an obituary and there's a tribute. He was our friends. He was part of uh, our movement, the 1960s of uh, New Eurekan and Black writers who got weary of other people defining them and decided to define themselves. Through the New Eurekan Poets Cafe, though it's known as the Center for Slam Poetry, a number of playwrights, including Wesley Brown, I'm Mary Baraka, Miguel Pinheiro, Pedro Pietri, and all of my plays have been formed there under the direction of Rome Neal. And Rome Neal's banana pudding series, jazz series, which you can get on YouTube, just go to Rome Neal's banana pudding jazz series, uh, is uh, this Zoom series is keeping uh, jazz alive in New York City because of the uh, because of COVID, which this uh, president, former president, excuse me, blundered us all into the biggest case of mass murder and criminal neglect in world history. Uh, jazz musicians cannot get uh, gigs, 
So uh, Miguel will be a, a mist. He was one of a kind, Shakespearean scholar. And he knew the location of all the best restaurants in New York. Thank you. Thank you, Ishmael Reed. So this concludes the 31st annual Penn Oakland Awards. Congratulations to all the winners who were able to attend and also to those who were not able to attend. And thank you for everybody who came on to the Zoom meeting today. I really appreciate it. It will be recorded on Zoom and in a few days will be uploaded to YouTube and Facebook. And once the link is ready, I will be sending everybody an email. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Tennessee. Thank you. <laughs> Yay, Thank Tennessee. You. Happy, happy birthday, Lucille. Happy birthday. Thank you. Happy birthday. Thank you, Tennessee. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.